Well, happy Thanksgiving weekend, Prairie Lakes Church. I'm glad to be here. How about you? There we go. There's still some turkey working its way through people, I think. Uh, some of you sound kind of sleepy uh, this morning. But hey, really, really glad that you're with us uh, this morning. And uh, I hope you had a great Thanksgiving. Uh, I hope all the turkey and the ham and the pie has worked its way out of your system so that you can be awake uh, this weekend for the message. Uh, my family and I had a great Thanksgiving. My parents came uh, from Nebraska, and so we all got to get together and have a great Thanksgiving. But then we watched football on Friday. And for a Husker fan like me, it was really depressing but now I can say go Hawkeyes, right? Because they're 12-0. and 0, And I keep telling people all weekend, if it can't be the Huskers, at least it's the Hawkeyes. So we can praise God for that. Unless you're a Cyclone fan, and then I'm sorry. Um, but <laughs> hey, we got a lot to be thankful for in this season. And I also want to say uh, happy Advent. Uh, so it is the Advent season. So happy Advent. Uh, Merry Christmas. So you know it's Christmas because you hear Christmas music everywhere, right? In the car, on the radio, at every store you go into, every elevator is playing Christmas music. And some of you love that. Some of you wish this could be like all year Christmas music, right? And the rest of us think you're weird, uh, just so you know. <laughs> but, uh, but really, really glad you're with us this week. And I know some of you are here for the first time, and you're, you're here with family. Uh, we praise God that you're here, and we hope that you feel welcome at Prairie Lakes Church. But uh, hey, this weekend, let's start the way we always do. Let's grab a Bible and a pen, and uh, grab your phone, tablet if you prefer. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a hardback Bible under a seat somewhere near you. Go ahead and grab that. And uh, we read out of the NIV version of the Bible. And uh, if you've got a phone or tablet, version is a great Bible app that you can read from. So we encourage you to do that. Go ahead and raise your hand if you need a pen. Ushers will come forward right now. They'll make sure that you get a pen. And uh, you can take notes on the back of your bulletin. There's a great spot there. We're going to put some main points on the screen so you can just jot those notes down. And here's what we know. When you write stuff down, you learn more. You remember more, and then you've got a place to come back to. Uh, if you jotted something down or God spoke something to you, you can write that down and then come back to it at some point. So that's, that's a really good thing to do. And while you're doing all that, let's welcome in every campus. We have six campuses spread all across the great state of Iowa, and we have about 300 people every single weekend that watch online from all over the world. So let's welcome them in this weekend. We're glad you are with us. Uh, so last weekend... I had this incredible privilege of going up to the Osage campus where I used to be the campus pastor and we celebrated five years as a campus, which is crazy for me to think about, that the Waterloo campus and the Osage campus have been in existence for over five years and that we've done this multi-site thing at Prairie Lakes Church for over five years and I just want to say thank you because last weekend we put all kinds of numbers and pictures on the screen up there and we just looked at all the hundreds and hundreds of lives that have been changed by Jesus through Prairie Lakes Church. And I just want to thank you so much for being the type of church that cares about people that are far from God. And being the type of, of church that cares so much about reaching Iowa. Because it's happening all over the place. I know we here in Cedar Falls don't always get to see all and hear all the stories. But God's doing some awesome stuff. So be encouraged. And thank you for being that kind of church. Um, and then the second thing I want to say is, uh, remember last weekend if you are around, we, we finished this three-week series called Praying for a Miracle. And if you were here, uh, if you weren't here, what we did is we wrote down this big miracle prayer. We, we wrote it on paper. Here's what I'm asking God to do. Here's this miracle thing that only God can do that I'm asking him to do. And we handed one in and we held on to the other one so that we could be praying for it. And what we said is every Tuesday for the next several weeks, uh, we're, as a church, we're going to pray and we're going to fast. And we're going to ask God to do these amazing, wonderful things. And so last Tuesday as a staff, uh, here in Cedar Falls, as staff and pastors, we got those cards out. And we read through them and we prayed over them. And it was really, really humbling to just hear all the things that you're asking God for. A, a lot of you were, were talking about things like, I want this reconciliation in this relationship. I want God to do this miracle and fix things. Or I want to be able to forgive this person over here that I haven't ever been able to forgive. Or I want my coworker or my neighbor or my brother or my son to know Jesus. And it was just really, really humbling to do that. So just an encouragement to remember, for the next several weeks, we as a church are going to fast on Tuesdays, whether that's from a meal whether that's fasting the whole day, whether that's fasting from social media, whether that's fasting from all media, but just spending time on Tuesdays to say, hey, I'm going to pray and set this time aside so that I can pray that God would do this miracle in me and through me and around me. And God has already answered one of mine. I'm happy to report. Uh, so last Tuesday, I had to report for jury duty. Middle of Thanksgiving week, right? Middle of preaching this Advent series, what happens? I get called to jury duty. So here's what I do. I do the normal thing. I call them Monday night because you got to call the night before, right, to see if you got to go. And I call and I'm praying, okay, Lord. And here's my prayer the whole time. God, I'm willing, but I'm not eager, right? Like, God, if you want this pastor to be on a jury, I'll do it, 
but I'm not going to be happy about it, okay? So I'm calling in the night before, and I'm like, group, I don't know, 18 or whatever. And they're like, group 16, report as scheduled. Group 17, report as scheduled. And I'm like, oh, no. Group 18, you know, I'm holding my breath. Report as scheduled. I'm like, no. And then I get to group, and it says, group 19, you don't have to report. Have a great Thanksgiving. And I'm like, why couldn't I have been in 19, you know? Like, ugh. So I get up early. I get to the courthouse, like 8.15, the, the room is packed, there's like 80 people, right? And I'm like, this isn't good, like this is a bad sign right off the bat. If there's this many people in here, this is bad, right? And I'm like, but they won't call me, they only need like 12, right? And there's like 80 of us. So they start reading through the names, and sure enough, my name gets called. And not just my name, they use my legal name, Donald Ermacher III. And I'm just like, they outed me in front of everybody, right? So then I got to sit in one of the juror chairs, and they go through all the lawyer's questioning and all those weird questions they ask you, you know, and then they look at you and Mr. Your Macher, and they can't say my name right. And I'm like, okay, whatever. But I'm sweating bullets because the judge looked at us, the pool, and he says, hey, take next week off of work and part of the week after. I'm like, this is going to be like a 10-day trial. This is a big deal. And I'm like, Lord, no. Lord, no. Lord, no. Right? And so then they get to the end when they're striking people and they're reading off the names and I'm sweating bullets and they get to the people in my row and they call the name of the person two down from me and they stand up. And they call the name of the person next to me and they stand up. I'm just like, no, Lord. And they skip over me and call the person on my left. And I was so happy. I was like, I didn't want to show it because I felt bad for the other people that had to serve, you know. But I was like, I got a week of my life back. And I was like, thank you, Lord. So just proof on this Sunday that miracles do happen. God answers prayer. And even when you're willing, sometimes God won't use you, which is very good news, especially for me. Um, but hey, make sure that you're praying and fasting on Tuesdays and just see what God does. And as God answers some of those miracle prayers, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to know about that. Uh, so make sure you let us know when God answers some of those just so we can celebrate and thank God for what he's doing. All right, hey, it is Advent. It's the Advent season and we're in a four-week Advent series called Arrival. And the word Advent literally means arrival. And every year about this time as a church, we celebrate the arrival of Jesus Christ. And usually what happens is we look at the gospel stories through different lenses and different angles and different perspectives. But what we're going to do this year is a little bit different. We're going to zoom out a little bit. And we're going to ask the question, why did Jesus come? Why did God send his son to enter the doorway of this world to save us? Why Christmas? Why Advent? Why did Jesus come? And the four things we're going to look at through this series are this. Jesus came to show love. Jesus came to give peace. Jesus came to be present. And Jesus came to bring redemption. Those are the four main reasons why Jesus came to us at Christmas. But we're going to begin this weekend with love. We build this idea that Jesus came to us to show love. And I want you to write down this big idea this weekend. Write this down. This is a big idea the whole message this weekend. The motivated by love. Jesus came to us so that we might be able to come to God. Motivated by love, Jesus came to us so that we might be able to come to God. We begin with love because love's the primary motivator for God. The, the divine impulse to love is the primary reason why Jesus was sent to us because God loves us. And so we're going to talk about God's love today. And I know as soon as I say that, here's the tension that some of you feel, right? It's what I call the tension of familiarity, the danger of familiarity, because we talk about God's love all the time. Even if this is your first time in church in a long time, you know these things. Jesus loves me, and God is love, right? Even little kids know Jesus loves me, this I know, right? We talk about God's love all the time. We sing about God's love. We read about God's love. And sometimes things that are so familiar and so close can become commonplace. They can become boring. They can become ordinary. And I think sometimes God's love is like that. Let me give you an example from life. How many of you, and you don't have to raise your hand, and don't point if they're in the room, by the way. How many of you have ever walked into somebody's home for the first time and it smells kind of funky, right? Like it's just not, like, it's not how your house smells. It's like wet cat with some kind of weird casserole and it's all mixed together. And you're like, their house smells like this. And you're kind of like, whatever, maybe they just burnt something in the oven, right? One time deal, no big deal. You go to the house a second time, it smells like wet cat and crazy casserole. And you're like, their house really smells like this, right? And you don't want to be rude, but you're kind of hinting at it like, hey, is something burning? And they're like, no. Does your house smell? And they're like, no, my house always smells like this, right? And you're like, oh, man. You know? And they don't notice it because they live there. It's just where they're at. Every single day, it's familiar. It's how their house smells. But you walk in and you're like, man, 
this smells bad, right? But that's the danger of familiarity. And sometimes with God's love, we sing about it and we read about it and we think about it. And all of a sudden, it's like it becomes too familiar and it loses its power and it loses its awe and its wonder. So here's what I want this weekend for all of us. As we talk about God's love this weekend, I want you to be moved. I want you to be in awe and wonder again at how much God loves you. I want your heart today in this whole four-week series to be drawn into worshiping God and saying, God, you are amazing because your love is wild and it's crazy and it's deep and it's awesome and it's for me. That's what I want for each and every one of us this weekend, but also through this whole series, to be amazed at God's love. So as we begin, if you would turn in your Bibles to John chapter 3 with me, John chapter 3. And if you're not familiar with the Bible, uh, the New Testament goes Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. And John's about three-fourths of the way through the Bible. And uh, in John's Gospel, we're going to start in in chapter 3. And uh, if you don't like flipping through the Bible a lot, uh, you're going to be happy because we're going to spend all of our time today in John chapter 3. It's the only passage we're going to read. And I'm going to talk through part of this story of Jesus having this encounter with this man named Nicodemus. And poor Nicodemus, he doesn't know what he's getting into because Nicodemus' world is about to be rocked. His world is about to be blown apart in the best possible way by Jesus. And so if you would, look at John chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Here's what God's Word says. It says, Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling Council. Now, this first sentence tells us a lot about Nicodemus. He was a Pharisee. He was a religious guy. He knew the Old Testament. He followed every Old Testament law frontwards and backwards. He was a religious holy roller. But he wasn't just a religious dude. It says he was a member of the Jewish ruling council, known as the Sanhedrin. It was 70 Jewish men, scribes, Pharisees, and then the high priest, 71 people. And he was a member of this council, which meant that he had political power. He had religious power and authority, and he probably had a good amount of wealth. This dude, Nicodemus, was somebody important in Israel. He was a big deal. Look at verse 2, though. It says, he came to Jesus at night. Now, why would he do that? He's doing that because he's heard about Jesus, and he's probably seen Jesus do some miracles, and he's listened to his teachings, but the Jews, and especially the, the Pharisees, did not like Jesus because he was upsetting the apple cart. He was tipping things upside down. And so he was risking a lot to come to Jesus. So rather than come to Jesus during the day or publicly, he came to Jesus at night. He didn't want to stick his neck out there. And here's what he said to Jesus, verse 2. Rabbi, he calls him teacher. We know that you're a teacher who's come from God. For no one could perform the signs you are doing unless God were with him. He says, people are taking notice, Jesus, of all that you're doing. And God must be with you. So what gives? Where's your power source? How are you doing all of this stuff? And look what Jesus says. Verse 3, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. And look at verse 4, I love this. How can someone be born when they're old, Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot, cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb and be born. If you're a visual learner, I apologize. This is awkward, right? You got this old dude, Nicodemus, whose mom is even older, and he's like, Jesus, I can't go back in, right? Like, it happened once, I'm not going, like, what are you talking about? And I'm sure Jesus at this point was like, dude, you missed the whole point of my conversation, right? I'm not talking about physical birth, right? Look at verse Five, Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. Jesus is saying, look, Nick, here's the deal. There's two different births. There's a physical birth, which you have, and there's a spiritual birth, which you need, right? And this is, this is rocking Nicodemus' world. Like he is shaken by this. And Jesus in verse 7 continues. He said, you should not be surprised at me saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit of God. And look at verse 9. I love this. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. How can this be? The dude's world is crumbling because he had built his entire world. His entire life had been built on, I'm a good guy. I'm working my way towards God. I'm pleasing God. I'm keeping the laws. I'm doing all the right things. And now this Jesus says, I'm missing the boat. I've been a good guy. I'm pursuing righteousness. And now this Jesus is telling me, I'm missing life. And I don't have it. And I need to be born again by his spirit. And it's completely shaken Nicodemus up. Look at verse 10. 
Jesus says, you are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people, meaning the Pharisees, do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? And then he says the reason for why he came, verse 13, no man has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Why did Jesus come? He just told Nicodemus, so that you may have eternal life in me, so that you may be born again. And here's the cool thing about Nicodemus. This isn't the end of his story. So in chapter 7, we see Nicodemus in chapter 7 of John. In the Sanhedrin, Jesus is being tried before them, and he defends Jesus twice in front of all of his peers. He defends Jesus publicly in front of all of his peers. He sticks his neck out there. And then at the end of John, in John 19, after Jesus had been crucified, Nicodemus is there with Joseph of Arimathea, and they take the body of Jesus from the Roman soldiers, and they spend a whole lot of money anointing his body for burial. You see, this Nicodemus had had an encounter with this gift of love named Jesus, and he'd been transformed. He'd had this born-again experience where he was a new guy and a new person with a new mission and a new heart. And he was following after Jesus. He was one of the few people there after the crucifixion because he had encountered this gift of love named Jesus, and he'd been forever transformed. Now, we're about to get to John 3.16. And again, there's that danger of familiarity, right? This is a verse that almost all of us have memorized. It's the verse that is like Awana 101, right? That little kids learn. Uh, Most of us have it memorized even in the King of James Version. It's the verse that you see at sporting events on signs, right? This is the verse. And so instead of just fly through it, we're going to go slowly through John 3, 16 and 17. And we're going to talk about what it really means that God loves us so much that he sent his son. And so let's look at John 3, 16. 16. We're going to look at this bit by bit. John 3.16 starts like this. For God. And I'm just going to stop there. For God. Two words. But I want you to write this down. God is a personal, righteous, and uncreated God of love. God is a personal, righteous, and uncreated God of love. We begin with God. Before we talk about God's love, we have to talk about God. We have to clarify who God is because if we don't understand who God is, we're not going to understand how much God loves us. We can never understand the depth of God's love for us unless we understand who God is. And a lot of people talk about God, right? From Oprah to the Pope to President Obama, all kinds of people mention God. And there's a lot of vague spirituality in our world. But when we talk about God, this is who we're talking about. We're talking about this God who is personal. God is personal. He's a person. He's not just some abstract random force. He's a person. We know that God is one God in three persons. He's Father, He's Son, He's Holy Spirit. Perfect friendship, perfect unity in who God is. God is personal. He thinks. He feels. He has desires. He has a will. God is personal. And our personal God knows you personally. This God who is a person knows each and every one of us. He knows our names. He knows the number of hairs on our head or that used to be on our heads like me, right? He knows who we are. And not only is God personal, but he's righteous. He's a holy God. He's altogether different. He's set apart. Everything that God does is right because he defines right by how he acts and who he is. He's righteous. He's sovereign. He's the ruler over everything that is. And not only that, but he's uncreated. God has no beginning and he has no end. This is the seven-year-old girl that raises her hand in KidVention. I love this. And she'll say, Pastor Chip, who were God's parents, right? Where did God come from? Or maybe his parents or grandparents, you've had this asked before. And, And you get to tell your child or your grandchild, look, God wasn't born. God's always been. He has no beginning. He has no end. And they're just like, right, like mind blown. God is uncreated and eternal. But above all those things, our God is Love. He's a God of love. He is a God of perfect love. And God defines love because he is love. That's the God that we're talking about. When we talk about God's love, we first have to remember, okay, here's who our God is. For God, and here's the next part of that verse. For God so loved. 
For God so loved. I want you to write this down. God's love initiates. God's love initiates. The Bible says God so loves. It could have just said for God loved, but it adds that qualifier, so loved, that God so loved the world, that God so loves us, that he initiates, that he doesn't wait for us to come to him. God takes action. And here's what I know about love in our culture today. We misuse the word, right? We throw the word around for just about everything. And typically in our culture today, when we talk about love, what we mean is a feeling, the feeling of love. We say things like, I, I love this person, or I'm just not in love with him anymore, right? We use the word typically to mean emotions. I feel this thing. We talk about finding love, right? As if somehow love just going to someday bite us in the rear, and it's like, oh, there's love. Great. Awesome, right? We say things like, I love Pancheros, and I love my wife, and I love God. And it's the same darn word in English, and so much is lost in translation. But here's what we mean when we say God loves God's love is not just a feeling, although God does feel love towards us. God's love is an action. It's a commitment. It's sacrifice. It's generosity. It's it's giving. It's not just feeling. It's giving. Love to God is action and sacrifice and generosity. And it's covenant commitment type love. It's the type of love that says, I love you on your best day and I love you on your worst day. I love you no matter what. That's the type of love that we're talking about. For God so loved. Who does God love? For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world. And I want you to write this down. God's love is for broken, rebellious enemies. God's love is for broken, rebellious enemies. It is. And when the Greek word there for world does not mean dirt and oceans and mountains. It means the mass of fallen humanity. It means people. For God so loved each and every person. He loved us. Sinful and rebellious as we are. He loves us. And my friends, if you don't hear anything this weekend, I want you to hear this. God loves you where you are. Doesn't matter how long you've been following him or if you've been following him. Doesn't matter how much you've sinned. Doesn't matter who you are, where you've been, or what you've done. God loves you. I know some of you right now feel like you've wandered too far. Some of you feel right now like, gosh, that thing I'm dealing with right now, this addiction I've got, the struggle I've got, this inability to do whatever it is, and you fill in the blank. You feel like, I cannot possibly come to God. Friends, you need to know, God so loved you, and God still so loves you. Now we need to think with me for a moment about all that God sees. God exists outside of space and time. He entered space and time with Jesus, right? He entered our human history. But apart from that, he's outside of human history and time, which means that he can see past, present, and future as present. He sees everything. God sees every action. God knows every thought and every motive. He hears every word. And I want you to think about, particularly lately, The evil that has been in our world that God has seen. Terrorist attacks in Africa and Paris. The shooting just the other day at Planned Parenthood that took the life of a pastor, right? And not only that, but think of all the sin that God sees in your own life. And think about how you would respond if you saw all of that, right? How would you respond? Here's how God responds. He loves. He loves anyways. He loves in spite of. God loves, even though he sees and he knows all of that, God still chooses to love. And here's how God chooses to love. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. He gave his one and only son. Write this down. God's love gave the most precious gift. God's love gave the most precious gift. Gift. The word give there we could translate send. God sent his one and only son. You see, what we have to remember is that God had always always existed in Trinity. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Perfect friendship. Perfect unity. Perfect relationship. And God sending Jesus to us that first advent cost God something. It cost God relationship. That he sent Jesus That that perfect fellowship with himself was different. It was changed. It wasn't the same when he sent Jesus to us. Friends, I've got an 11-year-old son. I've got one son. I've got a boy. I know many of you as parents and grandparents can relate to this. 
If someone walked up to me and they said, hey, Pastor Chip, there's this death row inmate over here, and we know he's guilty. If you would just give your son's life for him, we'll let him go, right? There is not a snowball's chance that I'm saying yes. There's no way. No way. And I know you as parents and grandparents can, can identify and go, yeah, me neither. I'm not raising my hand for that. But this is what God does for us. And this is what God's love does for us. That he looked at his son and he said, son, I've got a job for you. I want you to go. You're going to be conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit in a virgin's womb. You're going to be born in a barn, in a feeding trough. You're going to become a child. You're going to be a child so that my creation could be children of God. He, he says, I'm going to send you and you're going to do this thing. and You're going to live this life. You're going to experience all the pain. Emotional, physical, relational pain. You're going to feel what it's like to be sinned against. And eventually your arms are going to be stretched out between two criminals. And you're going to bear the weight of the sin of the world. Son, I've got a job for you. And he goes. He is sent to us. My friends, so often we talk about God's love, but we forget that God's love cost God. It cost him. And it was the most precious gift he could possibly give because it was a gift of himself. My friends, the miracle we celebrate at Advent, the reason why we celebrate God's love, is that he became a child so that we could become children of God. The most precious gift for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And here's the outcome, you ready? Here's the outcome that whoever believed in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That we would live with God forever, that we would have new life. I want you to write this down. God's love makes a way for us to come to him. God's love makes a way for us to come to him. And notice he says whoever believes. It's not everybody. Not everybody receives this gift of love. Not everybody opens this gift of love that, that God has sent in Christ. Many do, but many don't. And, and that word believe doesn't just mean, hey, I understand that Jesus is Lord, or I understand that God is real. That word belief means to actually trust, and it means to receive. All who receive this gift have everlasting, eternal life. It's not just um, everybody. It's only those that receive this gift of God's love, the gift of his son. We have to receive this gift of love. But the question is this, what do we receive God as? Because there's a lot of people today that receive Jesus as a good man or a prophet or a, a good teacher or a healer or a miracle worker, but we have to receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives and Lord and Savior of this world. We have to receive him as God's only son. And friends, if we're going to understand God's love here, we have to understand what we're being saved from and what we're being saved to. When we receive this gift of God's love, like Jesus said to Nicodemus, we're born again. We're made new. But we're saved from an eternity separated from God in hell. We're saved from hell. And not only that, but we're saved from our own sin. We're saved from ourselves. We're saved from the penalty that our sin deserves. That's what we're being saved from. But we're being saved to this incredible life with Jesus forever. We're being saved to eternal life, heaven, forever. We're being saved to this life where it's called sanctification, where we're becoming more and more like Jesus day by day. That's what we're being saved to, this kingdom that has no beginning or end, this life with God forever. And my friends, understanding what we've been saved from, hell, what we've been saved to, eternal life, helps us grasp the depth of God's love. That God loved us so much that he sent his son to save us from all of our sin and to save us from our sin eternally. And to save us for himself. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Look at verse 17. It says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Jesus came to us not to condemn, but to save now, I know what the Bible teaches about the second coming of Jesus, right? He's coming back, and he's going to come back as judge. And he's going to separate those who are his from those who aren't, right? But the first time Jesus came, this arrival, this first advent, he came to save. 
And my friends, how often do we as Christians condemn others? How often do we as Christians point the finger and want to judge people's eternal soul and salvation? How often do we condemn based on how people act? Listen, friends, even when Jesus came, he didn't come to condemn. He came to save. And the question is, save us from what? And here's the thing. We have two fundamental human needs. And every human has these two needs. Whether we're rich, poor, young, old, it doesn't matter. The first need is this. It's the need that Jesus highlighted with Nicodemus. I am dead. In my sin and I need new life. God, I'm dead in my sin and I need new life. Even someone like Nicodemus who had done all the right things, right? He'd followed all the laws. And God still said, Nicodemus, you're dead. You need to be born again. We are are dead in sin. We need new life. And also we are guilty and we need forgiveness. Those are the two greatest needs that we have in this life. And God, out of love, sending Jesus to us, that first advent accomplishes both. That by becoming a child... And living a perfect human life to the power of the Holy Spirit is we have faith and trust in him and receive this gift of salvation. We have this newness of life. We are born again. The Bible says we are new creatures, new creations in Christ. We're new. But it's not just that we're new. It's that by dying on the cross and putting himself in our place, Jesus paid the penalty that we deserve. And therefore we are forgiven. God looks at us and he says, you're not Guilty. Not only are we his, but we're not guilty. We're free to live a new life. And we're free to be forgiven because God so loved us that he sent Jesus to us at Christmas so that we might be saved. So that we might be saved. So what difference does this make? What happens when we receive this gift? When we receive this gift of love and we are born again, everything in our lives is transformed. Everything is different. And I want you to write this down. Receiving the gift of God's love equals. Receiving the gift of God's love equals. Being transformed for eternity and for today. It equals being transformed for eternity and for today. Here's a beautiful truth that I want you to hear this weekend. If you receive this gift of God's love, you need to know this. You are transformed for an eternity. Your eternal address has changed. And here's the cool thing about that. This life, if you're a follower of Jesus, is all the hell you will ever experience. That's it. The suffering, the pain that you experience now, though temporary, that is it. Everything else in your life is from glory to glory to glory in Christ. That you have an eternal destiny in him that is eternal, that can't be shaken, that can't be taken. It is permanent if you receive this gift of love, God's son, Jesus Christ. But it's not just for eternity someday out there. We're transformed for today. We get a new heart. We get a new life. We get a new nature. When we receive this gift of God's love in Christ, we're fundamentally different. I can't tell you how many times I've had people around me uh, ask questions about my life just because of the way I live. I remember in college, I ran cross country at Hastings College, and there was this dude named Chris, this little guy, had the worst mouth. He was like Joe Pesci, constantly, right? Little, little guy, high-pitched voice, cussed all the time. And one day he finally looked at me and he said, uh, I'm sorry. I said, well, what are you sorry for? He goes, I cuss all the time. And I said, yeah, I noticed that. He goes, why don't you cuss? And I said, well, I'm trying to honor God with what I say. And he was just like, huh. Like, you can do that. Like, you can honor God. And he was just kind of taken aback. So literally, for two years, he was a couple years younger than me, for two years, every time he cussed, he came to me and he apologized. I kid you not. He'd just be like, hey, I apologize for what I said over there. I'm like, that's awesome, right? But here's the thing. When you are changed, people notice. And Jesus came to show love so that you could show love. 1 John 4.19 says this, we love because God loved us first. So when we are transformed for today, it means we live differently, and we love differently, and we talk differently, and we suffer differently. Why? Because we are fundamentally different, because the love of Jesus has transformed our hearts and our lives, and we are born again. We are different because of this gift of love that God sent, his son, Jesus Christ. But here's the thing. The gift has to be received. I know some of you right now, the the gift is sitting there out in front of you and you've been looking at it for years, but you've never received this gift of love. You've never taken hold of it and made it yours. If you haven't, I would encourage you this Advent to grasp for the first time that that gift is for you. God's love is for 
you. I know there's a lot of us who've already received that gift and we've opened it and we're enjoying this new life in Jesus, but a lot of us just kind of have fallen asleep spiritually. And a lot of us have kind of fallen into this this path of, yeah, God loves me, yeah, Jesus loves me, but it's just kind of this truth that we believe, but that doesn't really change the way that we live. And my friends, understand, God's love is so deep and it's so wide and it's so amazing and it's the most incredible force on the planet. And if you need to re-energize and reinvigorate and recharge and reconnect with that love, then this Advent season, make this your goal. To be awed and wowed and wondered again by the gift of God's Son, the gift of God's love this Christmas. To grab a hold of that, to believe it, and to let that truth sink into your heart in such a way that it causes you to live differently. My friends, God is love. And this incredible God of love loves you incredibly. He's already demonstrated that by sending his son Jesus to become a child so that we could become children of God. That is Advent. That is Christmas. That is why we celebrate. It's all about him and what he's done. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for this day and just a reminder that, God, you love us dearly. And Father, I know oftentimes we sing about it and talk about it and pray about it and and thank you for it. But God, so often I think Your love becomes too familiar to us. And God, help us to never, ever treat your love as if it were ordinary or plain or casual. God, your love is deep and it's eternal. And God, you sacrificed the most precious gift, your son, so that we might have life. God, help us this season of Advent to walk in that newness of life, to bring you glory, and to just be in awe and wonder and worship because of your great love for us. And God, help us to extend that love to all the people around us this season. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.